It's okay. You don't have to minimize it. I, would, I already, I already had the really disconcerting video experience of turning my back on it, realizing I was losing my hair. That was really horrifying. So we're going to go ahead and get started. It's about noon. Uh, my name is Kyle Bishop. I'm a program assistant for data science to take a value. You have probably seen some of my emails go out on the template list. If you are not receiving emails from me and you would like to, there's a sign-in sheet back there for uh, for today's seminar. There are also some, probably still some snacks back there. If you haven't uh, had a chance, so please let us know. Um, today we have Dr. Larry Hunter. We will be talking about artificial intelligence and medicine. In addition to being uh, the, the co-director of the training and education core for GPT, Dr. Hunter is the director of the University of Colorado's computational bioscience program and a professor, uh, professor rather, of pharmacology here and a professor of computer science at Boulder Campus. He received a PhD in computer science from Yale University in 1989 and then joined the National Institute of Health as a staff scientist, first at the National Library of Medicine and then at the National Cancer Institute, <coughs> coming here in 2000. Dr. Hunter is widely recognized as one of the founders of bioinformatics, served as the first president of the International Society for Computational Biology, and created several of the most important conferences in the field, including ISMB, PSD, and BizLab. Dr. Hunter's research interests span a wide variety of areas, from cognitive science to rational drug design. He's published more than 100 scientific papers, holds two patents, and has been elected a fellow of both the ISTB and the American College of Medical Informatics. So his primary research focus recently has been the integration of natural language processing, knowledge representation, machine learning, and advanced visualization techniques for both challenges in interpreting data generated by high throughput molecular biology. That's kind of a mouthful. Yeah, remind me to write a shorter short bio next time. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. And I'm going to start off with an apology. So I am recovering from whooping cough. Um, I know, in Denver in the 21st century. But anyway, uh, I'm not contagious. And if I do cough in the middle, it looks bad. But just give me a minute. I'll recover and it'll be fine. OK, so I'm sorry. And I also should say that, that this talk that I'm about to give, um, I gave uh, at the Gold Lab Symposium last May. And uh, Lisa Schilling, the co-director of D2V, asked me to, to reprise it for the D2V audience. So for those of you who saw it already, I apologize for that too. I know there's a few of you. Um, and it's also, uh, that, talk, that slot was a 40 minute slot. So it's a fairly short talk for this hour. And uh, my hope is that it encouraged, that have that much extra time at the end will give us some time for an interesting discussion, a little back and forth about some of the things I'm gonna say. So that's it, I wanna start off um, with the cover of the New Yorker from last spring, um, which had a very interesting uh, article about uh, whether AI was going to replace doctors. And uh, that's, it's a little crazy, but there's a quote from uh, Jeff Hinton uh, that he's widely interviewed in this article. And it's written by Sid Muckerjee, the guy who wrote The Emperor of All Maladies about cancer. It's a really interesting article. Um, and Jeff Hinton is one of the founders of modern artificial intelligence. He's, uh, as much as anybody responsible for all the deep learning stuff that's so popular these days. He's been publishing uh, network learning methods for 40 years, and he's a really smart, accomplished, interesting guy. And he said, and I quote, I think that if you work as a radiologist, you are like Wile E. Coyote in the cartoon. You're already over the edge of the cliff. You just haven't looked down yet. There's no ground underneath. And deep learning systems for uh, breast and heart imaging uh, have already been developed commercially. Uh, again, Hinton, it's just completely obvious that in five years, deep learning is going to do better than radiologists. It might be 10 years. He said that at the University of Toronto Hospital across the street from where he works, he's a University of Toronto CS professor, and it didn't go over too well. Um, the, uh, the, the, in, his, in that talk in the, at the hospital, he said, you should stop training radiologists now. You are doing a disservice to these people. And... Uh, that's a pretty strong set of claims. And I, I don't think it's really true, um, but I do want to point out um, that uh, AI is useful for certain kinds of diagnostic work, particularly around images. 
and that it's not really um, about AI versus MDs. It's not replacing doctors. It's doing things we wish we could do. So my favorite example of this is the one up here on the, your left is uh, diagnostic, diagnosis of um, retinographs uh, for di <coughs> diabetic retinopathy. And uh, we ought to screen for that. Diabetics um, are at greatly increased risk of retinopathy. If you catch it early, you can really prevent blindness. And uh, there are about 34 million diabetics in the U.S. Uh, who, are, who should be screened annually for this, and there's nowhere near enough ophthalmologists to do this. So if we could build an app somewhere uh, that could actually do this screening, uh, we could really uh, prevent a great deal of blindness and save uh, a great deal of human suffering. And that's true for a bunch of things, okay? So the dermatologic example on your right um, is on par with average dermatologists, and you can actually do this with a smartphone. Okay, so we can take a lot of underdiagnosed melanomas, catch them relatively early, um, and really make a difference. So I don't want to argue that deep learning doesn't play a role in medicine. It can really help us in places where, uh, in, in some places, it can help us deliver better care to more people less expensively. But in, it's not going to replace docs. And there's a, a variety of reasons for that. Oh, I, I have one other example I should mention, by the way. It's not just imaging where these learning systems are doing a good job. Um, there's a deep learning based cardiovascular risk prediction algorithm uh, that is substantially better, that uses routine clinical data. Um, it's substantially better than the American Heart Association ACC risk score, and it's also better than the Framingham score, and better than Q risk 2, and better than Reynolds, and everything else so far. It's a substantially better risk prediction. And so there are all kinds of places where deep learning can help in medicine. Um, and I, I don't want to dismiss that, but an important part of what it is that docs do is understand what they're doing. And so Mukherjee has a nice line about that. He says, the most powerful element in clinical encounters, he realized, is not knowing that or knowing how or mastering the facts of the case or perceiving the patterns that they formed. It laid yet in a third realm of knowledge, knowing why, having an explanation for what it is that they're seeing or why they make the diagnosis they do and the recommendations they do. It's important to talk to patients about the rationale uh, behind those uh, observations or those decisions uh, so that they can participate fully in their own care. And it's important to, to talking with other doctors about making the right decision. And it's also important about moving medicine forward and improving uh, the, the kind of care we can give based on our understanding of the underlying mechanisms involved. Uh, and Hinton makes an, an interesting metaphor. He, he talks about uh, how he admits how difficult it is to understand uh, the, the conclusions these systems come to uh, what they know and how they know it. Um, it's really difficult and lots of people have tried in various ways to, to uh, untangle what's going on in deep learning systems. And there's some interesting computer science going on around that. I won't say it's impossible, but it certainly hasn't happened yet. Um, but Hinton's metaphor is interesting. He says, imagine uh, pitting a baseball player against a physicist, okay, in, in, a, in a contest to determine where a ball might land. Okay, and so the Baseball player has thrown that ball over and over again, millions of times, and has, has a very good sense of exactly how high the ball is going to go and where it's going to land, and that has that the same way a deep learning system has it. But a physicist has a very different approach to that, okay? The physicist has an explanation, and it can, it can explain why uh, with equations to determine the same thing. Now, ultimately, they both may come to the same conclusion, but the understanding that the physicist has is of independent value in addition to just predicting where that ball is going to land. It has other kinds of uses. And so this, this question of, of how important is explanation, why does it matter, and, and uh, how AI systems don't yet have it, is a really important one for understanding how AI is going to fit into medicine. All right? It's not just the ability to recognize patterns um, or predict outcomes with a certain degree of accuracy, or even make choices about therapy. The ability to explain why is a consequence of having a, a cohesive causal theory in your head. It's not just about answering one particular question, okay? It's not about the, the, um, the, the relationship between the observation and the explanation of it. It's about the coherence of the entire causal system that underlies the understanding that allows us to do that. So it's a whole belief system. And there have been some really interesting philosophical approaches to explanation that have given us sort of the broad outline of what a computational theory of explanation would have to do. 
And the best part of that has actually been in the philosophy of biology. And I recommend this book um, by, by Carl Craver and Lindley Darden called In Search of Mechanisms. And the philosophy of biology has produced a particularly rich account of the, of the role of mechanistic explanations, which is somewhat different than in, say, physics, um, where it's the discovery of law-like behavior uh, that drives physics. Okay, and that's not true in biology. We, we relatively rarely observe law-like behavior, um, and instead we, we posit these uh, mechanisms um, that account for, um, and good ones at least, uh, productively continuously, the establishment or maintenance or uh, some other phenomena that we observe. So those mechanistic explanations actually go back a very long way. One of the great philosophers, American philosophers, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce, oops, typo in that, sorry, it's E-I, purse, um, has this wonderful quote, however man may have acquired his faculty of divining the ways of nature, it certainly has not been by a self-controlled and critical logic. Even now, he cannot give an exact reason for his best guesses, for though they go wrong oftener than right, the relative frequency with which it is right is on the whole the most wonderful thing in our constitution. Our ability to generate causal explanations, mediocre as it may be, drive science. Okay, we test those explanations. We have them compete against each other. We've built this edifice of understanding of biology and the translation of that into practice of medicine um, based on these intuitions we have. And we still really don't have much of a theory uh, of how that we come up with them. And the question here is, can an AI system, can a computer system actually do this sort of stuff? Can an AI system do what doctors know, which is know why? And it's an interesting question. If you look at um, the history of both psychology and, and artificial intelligence research, it seems to involve the, the two major systems. If you're familiar with Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, he talks about two systems. One is fast, automatic, uh, easy, um, and that's where those causal hypotheses come from. And the other one is slow reasoning, the stuff you have conscious access to, uh, where you think about the consequences of various things. And, more difficult kind of work, but both of those play a role in the science of biology and in, in generating uh, mechanistic accounts that uh, stand up uh, to test against evidence. And you can see this also in computational systems that do this sort of work. That kind of fast automatic stuff tends to be the realm of, of deep learning and neural networks and those sort of machine learning systems, whereas that sort of reasoning piece of it is more the realm of symbolic AI, um, where we can do that sort of logical or other kinds of, of inference. And in order to do this kind of work, in order to generate explanations and evaluate them and, and reason with them the way that people do, you can't just have the connection between one observed thing and its explanation. It really is about the coherence of a causal theory, all of it together. And so in order to be able to do this sort of work, you have to have in a computer program, if you're gonna do this in AI, that computer program has to have a fairly all encompassing a collection of causal theories. It has to have knowledge of a broad area to be able to tell whether or not a new explanation coheres with the rest of the explanations in its, in its system. And so people largely acquire this uh, at a very young age. If you've been around little kids, you're familiar with the phase they go through where they ask why about everything. And I love this XKCD cartoon, which uh, you, should, you should attend to while I'm telling you this. But it turns out psychologists are mean people. And they, they look at, they test the hypothesis that kids are actually asking those why questions just because they want to interact with you. And they don't really care about what the answers are. They do these very carefully controlled experiments um, where you give the ans kids who ask why questions answers that don't, uh, or you say things to them that don't answer the question. Uh, carefully balanced for length and number of syllables and complexity of the words and stuff like that. And it turns out the kids stop asking that person why questions almost immediately. They are really interested in the answers. Okay, and they are building up causal theories of the world. And the problem from an AI perspective or even a psychology perspective is by the time um, people get to college, which is where most of our psychology subjects come from when we do psychology experiments, by the time people get to college, they already have very elaborate causal theories about the world that they learned when they were three and four and elaborate causal theories about the social world that they learned as teenagers. And they don't have introspective access to it and it's already been learned. So it's very hard to write computer programs um, in, the, in the face of that, because it's hard to have any idea about even what the domain is that we have all these explanations in our heads about, let alone uh, how complete it is. So it's a difficult open question in AI. And I think that biomedicine is really fertile ground 
for creating our first real artificial explainers. And that's the kind of work that we do in my lab. And the reason we do that is people don't have that sort of implicit knowledge about the world or the social world or all those things we, we generate explanations to each other about. Um, nobody has implicit knowledge of molecular biology. It's all written down somewhere in textbooks and journal articles and things like that, maybe even in somebody's lab notebook or in a database. Um, so at least there's no elicitation barrier to getting all those causal theories, all that knowledge into some computer program. We know where it is. There's 10,000 textbooks, there's 25 million journal articles. It's big, but it's finite. And it has all of the knowledge that we need to build an explainer um, to the degree that people can explain. And so we can do this we can, we can maybe create good novel explanations because we can get a reasonably complete knowledge of the domain represented in a computer system. And so formal knowledge representations, things like the gene ontology that you might be familiar with or the open biomedical ontologies generally, kind of give us a basis for doing this, all right? And so I'm gonna describe a, a motivating use case that drives a lot of the work in our lab. And that use case is given a set of genomic regions or variants or gene products or concentrations, anything empirically derived from uh, sort of genome scale experimental assays. Um, we'd like uh, to produce an explanation of the region, the reasons that those genes or whatever are involved in that. And this is a very common problem. Anybody who's done work with modern sequencing technology or other sort of, of, of genome scale assays almost always comes back with hundreds, if not sometimes thousands of genes that are uh, relevant to the phenotype under study. And oftentimes what happens, they get published in supplemental materials and then we go and investigate five of them. But we're really missing out by not looking at the full breadth of implicated genes or gene products or variants or whatever it is and building up a causal theory that says, why are those things implicated in this phenotype? And so there's a, a real need for doing this. Uh, our collaborators uh, are very happy that we can put together such uh, uh, fairly complex sorts of uh, deeply supported answers to the, those sort of why questions. And we have a variety of papers where the analysis of the, the sort of the part that shows up in the discussion section came by virtue of using our computer programs. And while I don't really have time here uh, to describe those computer programs in the sort of detail um, that would satisfy the more technical among you, I, I had someone make a little movie that that uh, describes a little bit about how we do this. All right, here we going. Play. Ah, okay, so we're gonna take those ontologies. The gene ontology describes processes and locations and the like um, that describe the sort of things that biology does. These are all processes involved in endothelial growth. And then we're gonna link that stuff up with proteins, and they're also described in ontology that, that takes into account the evolutionary relationship, paralogs, and all that sort of stuff. There's a particular VEGF protein in the protein ontology. And so we can relate what's, what the proteins do to those processes. And what we do is take that information out of journal articles and databases, and we represent those things with the information artifact ontology, which says this database record is about that protein and that biological process. And so we can take all of these different ontologies to describe things like anatomy and uh, phenotypes and what gene functions do and the like, and all of these different databases that uh, include information about that sort of stuff, the pathways, uh, the interactions between the proteins, um, and these databases are very rich. So this is one Uniprot record, this happens to be for VEGFA, and it's gonna scroll through the whole thing and show you the, I forget, 40 some odd pages of information about that one protein in that one database and integrate that information with all these other databases, pharmacogenomic knowledge base, for example, um, in this system that uses these ontologies as the basis for describing what it is that are, that's in all of those different databases. And so it links them all together and it makes it possible to query that database with just knowledge of the biology without having to know where the information was in which different database it was in or what the different uh, databases uh, formats are or the like. So we take a database and we represent it in that information artifact ontology. We say this is a record in that database and it has these fields. And field number four is a protein identifier taken from a Uniprot ID. Um, and field number six uh, is a, a Go Biologic Process ID um, that says that that protein participates in that process. And so we can then take that representation of the database and transform it into a representation 
about just the biology and get rid of all that stuff about which field it was and what identifier and the like and build up a, a knowledge base of biology that has all the information from all those different databases. And that's pretty far along. And we are also getting to the point where we can take information from sentences in the literature and run natural language processing text mining code over it, produce representations of those in the same vocabularies using the same ontologies, and then use that to complement what was, we got out of the databases. Because as we all know, those databases are valuable and well-organized, but really incomplete. There's lots more information in the literature that makes it into those databases. We can't use all of the literature. It's not licensable for text mining, uh, but we can use PubMed Central Open Access, which is now 1.6 million articles, and an increasing proportion of the publications in the biomedical literature, are, are, we can do that. And now what we can do, once we've built this, is we can put together queries that reach across those different databases and where the answer requires putting together information from different places together into one thing and get an answer out of our knowledge base. And we can also do things uh, like uh, search through that knowledge base. So I don't know what the connection is between this chemical and this protein. Can you tell me? And we can do other kinds of things with this, like try to infer missing knowledge. We can use uh, network completion algorithms uh, or link prediction algorithms, the same thing that uh, Amazon uses to predict what you're going to buy next or what Netflix uses to predict what kind of movie you're going to watch next to guess things that are likely to be true, even though we don't yet have evidence for them. And so that knowledge base of biology gives us an opportunity um, to, to try and address this why question problem, because we have enough of the information we need to answer those questions, if not yet represented in kebab, which is what we call this knowledge base, knowledge base of biology. Um, it's at least potentially, uh, we, can, we can use these tools to represent that information. And right now there's relatively little causal information in there. I don't want to oversell this. We're not able to do it yet. And I want to give you a little idea of where we're headed. So we want to get to AI explaining, right? We want to be able to build programs that can explain things. And in order to do that, um, we need to do a few things yet. One of the most important things we need to do is be able to represent knowledge we don't have, things we don't know. So if you ask any scientist, they can always, they can tell you all kinds of things that they don't know yet, but they think they'll be able to figure out in the next week or the next month or maybe things that the field is gonna take 10 years to figure out, they all have a pretty good idea in their heads of things that they don't know, but we will know, or we wanna know, or we're trying to figure out, all right? So we need to be able to do that as well, to come up with these explanations. We also need a collection. We need a set of explanation patterns, the kinds of things that make explanations in molecular biology, at least, fall into a taxonomy. So we have explanations about how uh, proteins bind to each other and what that means, or how small molecules bind to protein and what that means, what that can do. We have explanations in our head about relationships, uh, regulatory relationships, uh, agonist, antagonist relationships, those sort of things. Um, and so we have a, a set of patterns and we wanna characterize those patterns. We can find them by looking at journal articles and carefully um, trying to uh, capture in our representational terms the sorts of things that show up in the introduction and the discussion section of journal articles that really are trying to get at these questions of why is this uh, appear. And then once we have those explanation patterns, uh, we'd like to be able to figure out which ones might be relevant to a new thing that we're trying to explain um, and synthesize these symbolic methods where, that represent the knowledge that we have with deep learning methods that might help us pick and choose among potential explanations and make variants of those explanations that fit the observations we're trying to explain. If we could do that, several things would be, would be a benefit. So one is uh, we would have a deeper understanding of how human beings do this. AI systems have often led to theories uh, that psychologists go and run with and, and make stuff out of. So that would be helpful. But more importantly, I think we would have uh, AI systems that were real partners in scientific discovery. Right now, AI systems are mostly used, machine learning systems, other kinds of bioinformatics systems, are mostly used to analyze data. If you will, they, they help you write the results section of your paper. If we could do this, it would actually help you write the discussion section of your paper. It would help you contextualize what you found, maybe find things from other domains that you're not as familiar with, um, and otherwise be useful in synthesizing information from this vast store that we really can't keep track of anymore. Okay, there's a, uh, when, when 1.6 million articles are, are published every year, which is roughly where we are in biomedicine, if only 10% of them are any good, that's several hundred a day. There's no way we can keep up. And furthermore, um, genes don't respect disciplinary boundaries very well. 
And it turns out that publications about, say, calcium channels and neurons might be relevant to calcium channels in cardiology, or might be something from nephrology might be relevant to understanding those calcium channels. So you can't just read in your domain and find all the things you need in order to be able to make sense of the results of your own experiments. So we could really benefit by having systems that could do this sort of thing. Everybody in science could, I think. And furthermore, we could actually apply this sort of stuff to do the kinds of things, ultimately, long term now, um, that those AI systems doing diagnosis based on images um, uh, can't do yet. And so it could really be an adjunct, an important adjunct um, to diagnosis and even beyond biomedicine. And so this is an important challenge and, and uh, lots of people are going after it. I want to recommend uh, Stuart Feierstein, um, who teaches a, a class in, in NYU, in Ignorance. And that sounds like a funny thing to teach a class in ignorance. Why would anybody want to learn about ignorance? But what he means by this is exactly what I was describing about scientists being able to say what they don't know. Uh, and it's wonderful. He has a little theory about uh, how we characterize what we don't yet know um, and why it's important to do that. But the really good part about this is the second two thirds of the book is a whole bunch of vignettes from different scientists of various kinds, uh, biologists, mathematicians, economists, all talking about what they don't know. Um, and what they're excited about, what they wish they could know, and how they're going to get there, and things like that. It's really fascinating to see the commonalities across these very distinct fields of science about the way we think about what we don't know and what we want to know. Um, I also uh, want to point out that we are on our way to trying to characterize this causality stuff. Um, and this is an example uh, taken from Lindley Darden and her collaborator, John Moult. Um, it doesn't use the ontologies that we are trying to use but they've been systematically going through trying to look at GWAS results, um, so variations that lead to some disease, and see if they can build the causal chain from the SNP to the disease. Uh, and the little black thing down the bottom there is one of those things we don't understand what that is. And so they're trying to build up a characterization of specific pieces of knowledge that are missing that we could use to drive some of these AI systems. Um, and there's also work in the ontology world to try and represent this stuff and so this is an effort uh, to try and build causal chains in those ontology terms um, so that we can, we can do a better job of representing in kebab this sort of causal reasoning that we would really need to be able to do this automatic explanation thing. And so there's a bunch of technical stuff underpinning that. Um, this comes from, uh, from Chris Mungo and, and Paul Thomas, by the way. It's a causal model of DNA mismatch repair in mice. But um, the, the details here is, there's, there's no free text representation. All the activity, all the, the molecular activity and larger processes and macromolecular complexes and all that are all from the gene ontology and the relation ontology and, and uniprod and the protein ontology, all this library of mechanisms that we would need. Um, we need to sort of combine the last two things that we did. We take um, the, the, those kind of causal chains with holes in them, mechanisms um, from the Darden world, and we represent them using the open biomedical ontologies, which are the basis for our knowledge base, and we should be able to uh, find patterns and, and build that library. And that's where we're headed. Of course, once we do that, we need to figure out how to do inference, and that's not easy in this world. Um, the, the hairball on, on your left um, is a relatively small part of our knowledge base that describes uh, VEGF um, and a bunch of proteins that it interacts with and a bunch of processes that it participates in. And it's just one protein's worth, okay? VEGF happens to participate in a lot of processes and interact with a lot of partners. So it's a little bit on the, on the high side, but it's fairly typical of the kind of thing. And so we can transform these things. Once we have the formal representation that we have, we might want to change that representation so that we can make different kinds of inferences. Sort of the way uh, data structures relate to algorithms. There's no perfect data structure. It kind of depends on what you're going to do with it. Um, there's no perfect knowledge representation. It depends on what kind of inference you want to do with it. And this transform gets us from a logical representation where all those yellow dots are sort of the intermediate nodes we need um, to make sure that our representation of things are logically consistent in, the, in, a, in a descriptive logic formalism. We project all that stuff out and make a more uh, networky based one where the relationships don't have several hops to go the way they do in the logical one. And then we can run those network inference algorithms I was describing before for community finding or link prediction and that sort of stuff in these transform networks. And I think to do the explanation work, we're also going to have to do various kinds of transforms to the underlying knowledge. But these are reversible transforms. You have a question? Uh -huh. Of 
Great question. Everybody wants to know. And so it's actually, it's fairly easy, but it's, it's got problems. And I'll tell you how we do it. So uh, imagine we have um, a journal article that says, I don't know, P53 interacts with MDM2 and some other journal article that says P53 doesn't interact with MDM2, right? They're both published. There's lots of that in the literature. So what we do and the, what all those yellow dots are about is basically we, whenever we represent anything, P53 is a, is a big class of things, okay? And we build a subclass. And the, we use OWL, it's a web ontology language. And so OWL, has, when you build a relationship in OWL using a restriction, the technical way you do it, what you're saying is between classes, you're saying all of the members of this class have that relationship to some member of the other class. So we build a sub, we make a subclass, we say these P53s, and then we build that relationship, do interact with MDM2. And so what we've just asserted is there is some subset of P53s that interact with MDM2. And we come up with another article that says they don't, we build a different subclass. And the different subclass, it says these P53s don't interact with MDM2. All right, now we don't know whether the, you know, in that case, we know the subclasses uh, are, have to be mutually exclusive. But in general, because we subclass all the time, we don't really know which ones belong together. And so that's, that's one of the kinds of inference we have to do. And it can be interesting, take the case of cytochrome C, where when cytochrome C is in the mitochondria, it participates in uh, phosphor, oxidative phosphorylation. When cytochrome C is in the, the cytoplasm, it participates in apoptosis. And so what we get is four different subclasses, the ones that are in the cytoplasm, the ones that are in the, nuclei, uh, in the mitochondria, the ones that participate in apoptosis, the ones that participate in oxidative phosphorylation. Now we actually like to combine two of those subclasses and say their members are identical because when it's here, it does that, and when it's there, it does this. That's a kind of inference for us. We have to put those together and figure out that they belong together. Um, but by doing all this subclassing and making everything separate, we have these subclasses. They may, they may not have any members. It might be there's no P53 that doesn't interact with MDM2. Who knows? Uh, but at least it allows us to avoid logical contradictions, even when there are conflicting statements in the literature. Uh, I hope that was comprehensible. I know it was a little technical, but anyway. Um, I, I'm really done, and I want to I take more questions. I'm going to make uh, one, one sort of uh, final comment, um, which is that I think it's, it's possible that we can build AI systems like that diabetic retinopathy uh, diagnosis assistant uh, or like that cardiac risk assistant predictor um, that are actually useful to human beings and don't replace doctors, but actually let doctors do other things that doctors are good at and help them with things like the breadth of screening that we have to do and other kinds of things that would benefit human health. And if we do get to the point where we can actually create an AI that's capable of explaining its thinking, um, I think, at least in, in, in molecular biology and interpreting molecular biology data, that will really change a lot of the way we do research for the better. It will allow us to act as if we knew the entire literature. It will allow us to actually find things from other fields and other domains that are relevant to the results of our own experiments and accelerate the progress that we can make um, in understanding life um, and improving human health. Um, I don't want to underplay how hard this is. Another one of my all-time favorite XKCD cartoons, uh, which I always bring out uh, whenever, you know, the, you know, you saw recently, uh, Watson Health, uh, gee, it isn't working so well. And the person at MD Anderson, uh, who was responsible for implementing it, said, who knew it was so difficult to hook a computer program uh, up to, to parse patient records? It's like, I've been doing that for 20 years. I know that's hard. Um, but, you know, you don't say. Anyway, we get a lot of that. Uh, I appreciate your patience. I hope this was uh, of some interest and value to you, and I'd be glad to take the remaining 20 minutes or so that we have and have a more interactive discussion about these issues. Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. So the idea is... Um, Computer systems make in, uh, inferences all the time, okay? So um, let's see, we can, we can make deductive inferences, so we can have a set of rules that say if this, then that, and I see this, so I'm gonna infer that. Uh, we make inductive inferences, so we see a bunch of, that's what machine learning systems do, see a bunch of examples of this thing, and so I figure out some relationships that I saw in those examples. Those are both examples of sorts of inference. The kind of inference uh, towards the best explanation is called abductive inference, Funny name, doesn't have anything to do with kidnapping, but it was coined by Peirce. Um, and that's a hard kind of thing. We don't really know how to do that. There's a bunch of inferences that people make that we don't know how to do. 
But the idea is to encode this stuff in such a way um, that we can take those steps. And so that link prediction algorithm I talked about where we look at patterns of relationships and graphs and say, oh, this is almost completely connected. So I'm going to guess that there's that, that one that isn't there really ought to be there. And so that's a kind of thing. Well, um, so there's, uh, let me unpack that a little bit. Um, so conflicting, conflicting ideas about things can be of two forms. One is uh, about disagreements about the world. You know, I, I think MDM2 interacts with P53. I don't think MDM2 interacts with P53. Then there's empirical answers to those questions. The way we do science is to try and come up with experiments that would distinguish between those two possibilities um, and make the way we make progress in science is to uh, address those controversies in the field. And so in, in that world, maybe uh, some of the things that I was just describing will help us address those things quicker and come to conclusions about uh, the right answer in those controversies. It's also worth saying that we can, if we can represent the things that are missing um, and likewise controversies, uh, then we can actually, a computer program can just say, well, some people think this and some people think that, and here are the consequences. So we could use that. The other kind of controversy is a controversy of what to do on the basis of the knowledge that we have. So different treatment decisions. Different physicians or other clinicians uh, might have different opinions about what the best course of action is, even though they both agree about what the state of the world is. Um, and those controversies are harder to resolve um, because they really draw on people's values in addition to the sort of facts of the matter. Um, and there, uh, AI systems might be useful either in encoding values, uh, helping us disentangle them, um, or at least getting us to the point where we agree on what the facts of the matter might be, and the human beings whose values are the ones who are important might have to still be involved in making those decisions. One of the things that uh, AI systems, even good diagnostic systems, are never going to replace is that conversation between a, a clinician and a patient um, that drives forward that, that sort of shared decision making um, that is the basis of so much of what we do. Yeah. I'm, I'm not quite sure how you explain the explanation. <laughs> and it's just in this sense. Where are you getting your forward level uh, statistics? Now, can you show the baseball and you just say, oh, well, this vector is gravity? Mm -hmm. How much do you need to know about gravity in order to approach it? Um, well, I'm going to hypothesize that, that physicians don't know as much as physicists about gravity, and they still can invoke it in understanding, you know, orthostatic hypotension or something like that. All right. So it, it's, it seems beyond our, the, the near term ability to represent uh, everything about science in a system like the one I tried to describe to you. But we do bottom out fairly low. So we can talk about things like the structure of proteins and how uh, an electrostatic potential uh, influences binding affinity, all right? And so I, I think it's a, from a computer perspective of trying to encode this stuff in a system so that we could use it, it's a pragmatic decision about where to bottom out. Um, it's really sort of about how much do we need to be able to do the, the sort of uh, task that we envision. And so, for example, um, when we use the system that I described, which exists and we use, um, to try and characterize what hundreds of genes or gene products are doing um, in a particular experimental result, there's no representation of gravity anywhere. We don't know anything about it, um, and we don't use it. And if it turned out gravity was important, so for example, we were doing things in plants, or we were trying to understand orthostatic hypotension, um, or you know what happens when you fall down a staircase, um, this wouldn't be able to do it. It doesn't have the representational ability at the moment. Now, it's not that hard. There are lots of computer programs that do a very good job of, of uh, calculating the effects of gravity to 10 significant digits. Okay, we're really good at physics stuff. Um, so if we needed it, we could imagine uh, trying to build something like that as part of the system. But for what we're doing now, we really focus on what genes and gene products do with each other and in physiologic systems. And so for there, we can exclude a lot of the things that you might want in a more general system. With EHR, the mandated and that was a common modality for record. 
Well, I hope so. Um, there's a whole bunch of barriers to getting there, though. Um, so EHRs are not tremendously useful uh, for that kind of work in a research context. Um, so they're large, you know, the, the old joke there was, you know, the original patient record in the, in the 19th century was there to remind you, oh, yes, Mrs. McGillicuddy, I remember I took out your gallbladder. Um, in the 20th century, they were there to get paid. Right, so you you, you give a, a record of the procedures and the diagnosis codes, and the insurer, you know, checks them and says, "Yep, here's your check." In the 21st century, they're there to keep you from getting sued or defend you when you end up in court. Yes, I, I counted you about falls and depression and smoking and all those other stuff. Um, and so those patient records are partially there uh, to help take care of patients. They are not there to phenotype people. Okay, and so I've done a fair amount of work trying to dig patient phenotypes out of out of EHRs, and it's really hard. And let me describe a system that I worked on many years ago, which kind of characterizes um, what a mashup EHRs are. Um, and this was a rheumatology uh, diagnosis system. And we built a machine, uh, I got hired at the National Library of Medicine to bring machine learning to the National Library of Medicine. At that point where there were these things called expert systems. And my boss had written an expert system to do rheumatology diagnosis. And it would take some inputs that would be the kind of thing you would see in a record labs and um, the like, um, and some findings. Um, and then try and tell you, you know, whether you had a rheumatologic diagnosis, and if so, which one of some I don't know, 20 or so that it could do. And so I built a machine learning system that took the same examples that ran through the expert system and tried to, to replicate the output. And it turned out you didn't need nearly as much stuff as you had to type into that expert system to get the same outcome. And in fact, you didn't, the interesting thing was you just had to look at which tests were ordered. You didn't even have to look at the results and I could tell you what the diagnosis was. And furthermore, the same thing, you, you could just look at which tests weren't ordered, and I could tell you what the diagnosis was. And the reason for that is those patient records actually it had not only the phenotype of the patient, but a reflection of the clinical judgment of the person who entered that stuff. And it's very hard to tease those things apart in those patient records. And so um, they're, they're moderately useful for phenotyping. They might one day be useful for trying to pick the right treatment modality using some computational means, they're already used fairly widely for decision support systems. Um, and what I would like to see is maybe we could um, come up with ways of making those records more useful for care. Um, so right now we pay a little attention to say transitions and making sure the right information is presented at transitions. But you could imagine systems, you know, those patient records get big, especially with medically complex patients. Those records are enormous. And we haven't really, for legal reasons, uh, been allowed to change the way those records are organized. Again, the 21st century patient record is there about getting sued. Um, so it's really hard to page through them and find anything useful. So could we come up with a system um, that when you presented in the ED with chest pain, would actually find relevant bits of your history and present it to the doc quickly? There's a guy named Foster Goss here. Nope. Uh, who's collaborating with Kevin Cohen in my lab and various others to try and build a system like that. Um, so th there's a lot of effort being done uh, within D2V and elsewhere um, to try to uh, make patient records and computer systems work better together to support quality care. Yeah. It's really critically important to think about that. Um, and it's not, it's not any easier with computer programs than it is with people, sadly. Um, one of the things that's really turned out to be true about these machine learning systems is they re-inscribe the same biases um, that appear in the data they're trained with. Um, the biggest example of that that I know of is actually not in the biomedical domain, but is in criminal justice. So the attempt to uh, make sentencing fairer um, has involved a lot of people taking historic data, training machine learning algorithms, and then making sentencing recommendations. And real judges are using this in real cases now. 
and a study was done of that, and it turns out the historic data has an awful lot of bias. Okay, so uh, people of color get longer, stiffer sentences than, than white folks for the same crimes. And the machine learning system took all that data in and faithfully reproduces that bias. Okay, so we have to be aware that the, um, this, the machine learning systems in particular reflect the training data quite well. And if the training data includes bias, then the machine learning system will include bias. And we have to be very suspicious of any claims that, oh, a computer made that decision, therefore it's not biased. That's wrong. Um, now, we can do things to represent stuff, right? Like I said earlier that we can work on representations of missing information and missing data. And so we can actually write down the sorts of biases that we think this particular data set might have, and that could be useful. Um, there aren't a lot of systems that I know of that really make good use of that, and it's kind of hard to imagine how you would. All you would say is, well, you know, we can't really draw conclusions about this. The changes that need to come are social changes about the way research is organized uh, or evaluated. Um, and that's slowly percolating through the system, um, but that's a, that's a cultural shift in the way we think about the world and do research, not so much something a computer program could solve for us. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's computationally very expensive to do this. So these are very big. Uh, our knowledge base has tens of billions of triples in it. Um, we use supercomputing routinely to be able to do queries over this. There's a bunch of kinds of things we'd like to be able to do that we can't um, because it would take too long. And we do a lot of work to try and speed this stuff up, think about more efficient representations, think about new algorithms to do things. But we are very much bound, and not so much by compute, the way physicists are bound in big uh, simulations, but we're bound by memory. Um, so uh, one of the things we've done and that we run this system on sometimes is we did a NIH shared instrumentation grant um, uh, and bought a very large supercomputer that has a very large memory. And it's not a, it's not a com raw compute power supercomputer, but it has huge memory. And this stuff really, because there's very little locality of reference, I don't know if it's going to be meaningful, but when, you're, when, you, when you look at one thing, the next thing you're going to look at isn't nearby it in memory. So if you, if you build a matrix or a linked list or something like that, there's this thing called locality of reference. And so you're pretty likely to want something nearby in memory so you can prefetch that stuff. And that's not true here. Once you follow two or three of those links, um, you're nowhere nearby at all. In, in, you know, you're near in semantic space, but not near in the representation in the triple store. Um, so a lot of the traditional ways um, we manage very large amounts of information don't work very well in these kind of knowledge bases. But fortunately, one of the reasons that we use the web ontology language and all the semantic web technology is lots of other people have that problem too. And so we can kind of piggyback on, on uh, some of the work that's done in more general computer science to speed up the stuff that we do. Um, and there's some really interesting things happening there, by the way. So um, GPUs look like they're kind of interesting for this stuff. And um, there's a bunch of stuff about building big uh, memories and then bringing the compute to the memory rather than taking stuff out of memory and bring it to compute. So there's kind of computer architecture ways to make this stuff go faster, um, but it's a real issue. Um, well, so we, we tend to update our knowledge base once a month. It's not really operational in the sense that, you know, people are banging at it every day and we want to update it every day. That would not be that hard to do. Um, would take more resources than we devote to that. Um, the hard part is making it bigger. So most of the work that we end up doing, we look just at human and maybe mouse. Um, and we don't load much of the other stuff because it's smaller that way. Um, and we don't load everything that we could because we kind of focus on the stuff that we know is going to be relevant to whatever particular problem we're going after. And by making it smaller, we make it faster. Um, but we're also missing out on things that we might learn if we had representations of, I don't know, Python or, you know, non-model organisms and all the stuff that's actually in those databases that we could use um, that might be relevant, we're missing out on. And there's other stuff, especially when we get to really mining the literature, and I, I, I hope I made it clear that we're not doing, we have techniques for doing that stuff, but the knowledge base right now is just databases, integrated databases. When we really start mining the literature, we're going to increase by 10 or maybe 100 fold the size of that knowledge base. Um, and that's going to be problematic computationally, burn that bridge when we get to it, computers get faster every year. Um, there are tricks.
All right. Oh, last question. Yes, science progresses one funeral at a time, I think is what he said. Um, yeah. uh, I, I think that overstates it. And John Ionis has, has really pushed that, you know, half of all we know is wrong, um, which is, I suppose, a little better than fire sign theater, which says everything you know is wrong. Um, but uh, I, I think that um, computational systems will help us manage controversies and understand them better, um, maybe resolve them better. Um, we can't, uh, I don't think we can fix the problems with research practices um, until we change some of the institutional systems we have. It was a wonderful editorial in Nature, I'm going to say last week, um, by the former dean of the Harvard Medical School about changing the way hiring and promotion works um, to look at reproducibility and robustness, not just the number of citations you got, but was your work reproducible, um, did it hold up over time, things like that, um, and, and making those promotion criteria, that will change the way the world works, okay? Computer systems can just point out some of the problems and identify maybe controversies that were missed, although it's a little, it's not quite as bad as people say it is. So, we often look back a few years ago and say, oh, well, that paper didn't really understand this other thing that really mattered, and now we do understand that, you know, microbiome matters. Um, and so all these papers before we realized are microRNAs, or take your favorite recent result, you know, all these things that were kind of confusing and maybe misunderstood a little bit, they weren't exactly wrong. You know, there's a normal progress in science. And uh, one of my students uh, originally wanted to do her thesis um, by looking for contradictions in the literature, you know, papers who said, a, you know, A equals B and some other paper that said, no, A doesn't equal B. Uh, and it turns out there are very few of them. What you really find is people more subtly attacking other papers. They're not direct um, uh, uh, sort of contradictions in the literature. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the model that Joe Smith was using is incomplete. Um, and she ended up uh, doing her work looking at citation sentences and trying to tell whether they were going to agree or disagree with the cited paper. Um, and that you can find those. There are disagreements in the literature, obviously, but contradictions are rare. Uh, one kind of funny footnote is um, the single best linguistic clue, one word clue, that somebody is going to attack a paper they're citing is the word notion. The notion that, hmm, that's going to be a negative citation. <laughs> Uh, trying to do explanation is rare. Not very many people are working on explanation. There are a lot of knowledge bases for a lot of different purposes. There's tons of work in AI and biology, AI and medicine, but the particular kind of stuff of trying to devise uh, uh, novel explanations is still sadly underrepresented in the research world and I'm trying to change that. Uh, I think if we succeed at this and we actually get some traction at it, then there'll be a lot of pickup. Um, there are a few people, the, the Mungo and Thomas thing that I showed you with the, the causal relations is related work. There are other people doing that kind of stuff, but it's, it's not a big, you know, right now everybody wants to do deep learning, right? And so we're not the hot topic. All right, I think that's a great place to end. Thank you very much. I'm sorry? The decline effect, not by name.